So we have been on a series. Who has loved our Heartbeat series? As per usual, you have to say it in a certain accent. Everyone say Heartbeat like an Aussie. Heartbeat. One more time, I've got to hear it again. Heartbeat. Heartbeat. So good. Don't you feel closer to Jesus when you do it that way? Like when you just say heartbeat like an Aussie, Jesus just kind of floods the room. We all know that the American flag is the best flag. The American anthem by far is better than my anthem. But the Aussie accent is exactly the voice of God, the Father. <laughs> it is just, it's a fact, don't, you can look it up. It's in the books of the Bible. One of those, the book of Chrysolothians, it is. Chrysolothians, look it up, it's good. And before you write me an email, I don't believe it's a real book. Uh, calm down, because you always get someone. It's like, hold up a second. I can't find that book. It's like, because it's not there. And it's okay, we don't read it either. Although, maybe I should write one. Kidding, kidding, it went really quiet. Everyone's like, too far, Chris, too far. So we've been on the Heartbeat series and it's been simple. It's been about empowering you and I to be who God called us to be. The reality is this, that we could put a lot of faith on somebody else to do what needs to be done. We could put a lot of faith on somebody else to step to the plate. And I don't think it comes out of laziness as much as it often comes out of the fact that we don't really believe that we can, that we are equipped enough, that we are ready, that we are good enough. But the truth is this, as simple as you may view yourself, as the lack that you are aware of, whatever it might be, God has got you exactly where He needs you. And the truth is this, that with God in the picture, your stakes and what you do goes up to a whole other level. God has called us for such a time as this and He's made us to be in this city, in this place, and He's called you to be in your workplace with your family. That's right, you can't leave them. You've got to be here in this place with your university, wherever you are, God has called you. And we've been reading Romans, Romans 10 because it speaks to us, not about perfect people, but about willing people. The reason that it calls their feet beautiful is because they were willing. They were willing to go beyond where they were, to navigate the obstacles and get a message to the people that needed it. And you've got to understand that in this context, this verse, why it made sense to people was because there was, there were, there, there were obstacles. I mean, it was a day and age where to bring a message to someone, there was personal sacrifice. There was personal sacrifice that had to be made, both on the journey, the things that they had to incur on the way. And we've been focused on it because I think this is the heartbeat of Jesus for the church as in the body of Christ, but it's also the heartbeat of Jesus for us as a church, right? That we wouldn't be a church that gets comfortable in an air-conditioned building. We wouldn't be a church that gets just basically on the endeavour of having you know, multiple services and, and, and just kind of sitting within that. That is where we are going. That is the trajectory. That's what it'll always be. But we must exist for something greater. We must do something that arrests the attention of a nation. We must do something where people far from Jesus look at us and say, there's something about that that I want. And that's not going to come from a pastor. That's not going to come from a worship leader. It's going to come from you and I. You and I realising that you are ready, that you are good enough, that you've got what it takes and that the simple things are often the best things. So we're gonna read Romans 10 as we have, and then we're gonna get into it. Is that cool? Yeah. Let me see and make sure that, you're, that, you're, that your vocals are working. Can you say, that, that's, great. that's great? Say, man, you are my favourite pastor <laughs> in the world, <laughs> even if I'm from another church. <laughs> I'm gonna record that, send it back. Okay, let's do this. Romans 10, 13 says this, for everyone who calls on the Name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. By the way, if you didn't know, totally, this is very important. Probably the most important thing I'll say at all service. It was my birthday and I'm 35. <laughs> I'm 35. And I might be struggling a little bit with that number. 35, and then I asked someone today, man, do I look 35? They said, completely. <laughs> so anyway, we sent them off. They won't be coming back to this church ever again. <laughs> they are not allowed. Honesty is good, but not all the time, okay? Romans, uh, I just told you that just so that you may later just be like, hey, Chris, happy birthday. It's just, I don't know, it's what I do. I don't take selfies, but I will tell you from stage what I want you to tell me. It's just. How, how it goes. But Romans, you know, I love this because it's talking about beautiful feet, which 
As you know, I am not fond of, I don't think feet are beautiful. We all probably feel the same way. I can even tell you where the foot has gone wrong. It is in the toes. <laughs> so it begs the question, why are these people calling these other people's feet beautiful? And it's simply indicative of a journey, of an imperfect, not all together, not arriving in style as you would imagine to arrive, just getting there, cut up, bruised, with personal cost, yet bringing something that changes lives. We've been focused on this because I don't think there's a better picture of what you and I are called to do. You ever notice, especially if you've been to college, you know, when you go to college and you come home for the first time, it's a pretty, in your mind, there's some grandiose ideas of how you will arrive, right? <laughs> like college is this magical thing where it will change all things. And when you come back to your hometown, everybody's gonna be driving by and they're like, wait, wait, what? Man, it's like your hair's flowing, things are amazing. There's just something about arriving to a place that we've been thinking about getting that we always make bigger, grander, better than we can imagine. But I love this verse because it speaks about something that is probably closer to reality. You know what I mean? Because there's like Instagram photo and then there's reality. You know what I mean? I've been saying that a few weeks. I walked past someone the other week and they were literally fake laughing for the Instagram photo. Yeah. They were like, laugh like this. <laughs> there's this sense that we've got this orchestrated idea and ideal of what it will look like when we get to our purpose. You know what I mean? Like when I finally get up and preach, when I finally get married, when I finally get my breakthrough, it's going to look like this. And I think this, that the, 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 the majority of the church won't move because it's waiting for one day when things look amazing. It's waiting for one day when everything lines up and everything is together. Yet what I love about this verse is it talks to us about embracing our journey. If you have mountains in front of you, they're your mountains to navigate. If you have giants in front of you, whatever you've got to walk through, you may have to walk, but the, the, the obstacles are not the main thing. The message is the main thing. God has put you here for a reason and He has put you here in the exact right season. You might not feel like you've got what it takes. You might feel like you've got a long laundry list of why you can't, but the reality is this. I am here to tell you that you can because how will people know about the God that we serve unless you go? And I tell you this, people will not be encouraged by how perfect you are. In fact, it's usually discouraging. You ever been around someone that's just so perfect? Man, it's frustrating. Try eat healthy around, unhealthy around someone that's eating healthy. I get negative. I'm like, I, I, wanna, I just want to bait them. You know what I mean? I'm like, you should have this. This is incredible. It's a triple cheeseburger. Because there's something about someone's perfection. It seems hard to reach. And if we peel back the layers, we all know that there is no such thing as a perfect person, perfect home, perfect relationship. But for some reason, we seem to think that we have to be so before we can be what God calls us to be. So I wanna speak to you in the midst of your mess. I wanna speak to you in the midst of your worst season. I wanna speak to you in the midst of everything going wrong. I wanna prep you for that. Because I tell you what, when you get about doing what God's called you to do, you better know that if the devil is real as we know he is, he's gonna get about trying to stop you. And we often take the hits in our life as an indication that God is not with us. But the reality is this, you often get hit when you're on the right path because something needs to stop you from being the you that God created you to be. We have a thing on our People Church team and we don't enforce it in any means, but we do kind of try to live by this. Audrey and I have noticed that in the biggest hits of our life, we find ourselves in this place. In the biggest hits, when we've had miscarriage after miscarriage, we got up and we preached the next weekend. And you know why? Because I can't encourage you to walk through your mess to deliver a message if I won't do the same thing. I don't need time off when I'm hurting the most because if I'm gonna tell you to come here when you're hurting the most, I've gotta do the same thing. The reality is this, I wanna humanise this a bit. I wanna take off the Instagram layers. I wanna be the, the, the you that slept in, wait, ate way too much ice cream and is still in your PJs at 4 p.m. You know what I mean? <laughs> like that you, you know what I mean? And your team building exercise shirt that you never use except for going to sleep. Like that, that you is the one I wanna speak to. I wanna speak to you, the, 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 the you that has spinach in their teeth, the you that is awkward, the you that just does things that they shouldn't do. That's the you I wanna speak to because that's the you that you often feel shouldn't get out the house but that's a you that people are encouraged by most. Yeah. Your perfection is paralyzing. 
to you and the people around you. But embracing who you are and who you're not is also an invitation for grace to make its way into your house. And maybe you're not what you could be because you're not embracing who you are, therefore who you should be. There is freedom in this. This is one of those Sundays where everybody that's sucking in right now, you can just... <laughs> Except me. Except me because I had a fair few cupcakes because it was my birthday. We even bored enough with a calculation that everyone can have one and Chris can have four. <laughs> that laugh was way too judgmental. <laughs> way too judgmental. Like it was like, oh my gosh, this guy. No wonder you're preaching about this. Hey, you're ready, you're able, you're good enough. And I'm not saying it because you are good enough, but because Jesus makes you good enough. That's the beauty of this thing. It's real people pushing towards a real calling that doesn't look like you got it all together. It's simply real getting before people and allowing God to be God. I wanna to speak to you from the simple subject today. Don't sleep on the small things. Don't sleep on the small things. You know, I've found that it's the small things in life that often end up being far more impacting than you can imagine. You know what I mean? There's that stupid saying that says sticks and stones. Is it, maybe it's just in Australia. Maybe it's just an Australian saying. I never know. I never know because I say things and when you just look at me blank, I refuse to believe it's my preaching. I just, it's my accent. <laughs> sticks and stones may break my bones, but such a dumb saying. No one ever went to a therapist because of sticks and stones. You know what I mean? So this one day I was walking and I tripped. I tripped. I just tripped. No, we go to therapists because of what someone said or did not say, right? There is something about it. There is something powerful about it. There is, it, it is more than just what we go through in life. The things that are said to us, the things that we encounter, they shape us, they, they form us, they, they stop us, they move us. And I'm hoping that today that we could move in to something big because the small things, they matter. The small things do something. It's like you could be caught up on a small word that someone said to you years ago. Someone told you something and you still think that way. I mean, some of the biggest injuries have happened from small people. I remember I was playing soccer, right? And uh, I was like weaving around people. And I'm not just saying that because it sounds good, right? I was just, I'm, 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 man, I'm weaving. People were screaming out, is that messy? And I was like, no, because he didn't exist yet. And then, you know, I'm just like running. And I could get past everyone. And this one guy, this little guy, that all game was just everywhere. Wherever I went, he's there. He just, he just touches the ball enough for it to go under my next step. And I just remember slipping and smacking the back of my head. And I remember just getting up and I was like, I'm fine. And my coach was saying, get off. My dad's saying, you should come off. And I'm like, I'm fine. You know what I mean? I'm Chris Carmona, you know, I'm okay. Until I realized that I was running like this. <laughs> bam, bam. It's the small things. The small things are often the things that you just dismiss because they're small, right? I mean, we all don't have small dreams. We want big dreams. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to get out of college and get a small wage. You want a big wage. You know, you want, you, want, you want to get to a marriage that is like a Hollywood marriage. You know what I mean? Like on the first day of your marriage, your husband rides in on a white horse with croissants. You know what I mean? Sorry, I'm preaching from what I did for Audrey again. Uh, I gotta stop. It just puts distance between you and I, I mean. We want the good stuff, right? Like, like when we started this church, I was like, man, they're gonna have to, we're gonna be just, just like Acts. You know what I mean? Like thousands were added to their church daily. And I was like, I was convinced it's gonna happen. And I used to pray this prayer that I thought was spiritual. I used to say this to Jesus all the time. And I thought I was so spiritual for saying it. I would say this, Jesus, and I would cry out because I, I get a little bit passionate. And so the weird thing is that this happens even if you're not here. Like if you're not here, I'm in my room, just ah! Or just like, babe, keep it, keep it down. I'm sitting there, I'm like, Jesus, if I can't lead a big church, I don't want to lead one at all. He's like, I was like thinking I just impressed him, you know, like. <laughs> I know, I know. You don't have favourites, but you do. And I remember once I had, I was at youth and I was running young adults and for whatever reason, like 60% of the people just didn't show. I don't know if they tag teamed or something. You know, like you're in, I don't know what happened. But 60% didn't show. And I remember thinking, whatever, I'm not preaching. I'm gonna preach a real, like I'm just, man, I got a 35 minute message. It's gonna be done in five and we're out of here. If they're not gonna show up, I'm not preaching. Again, I thought that made sense. And then God says to me, so why are the people that did show up paying? 
I remember straight away, something was brought to the surface for me. That I'm good at running for the big picture. I'm good at doing the big things. I'm happy to be in on the big projects. I'm happy to be the person where everything good is happening. But who are you when the bad things happen? Who are you when you don't have the beginning you want? Who are you when the, t the people that you've been called to speak to, they're not there yet? Who are you when you walk into a destination and it's not glamorous yet? Who are you when you don't have the thousands? Who are you when nobody's looking at you? Who are you then? Because it's easy to, to sleep on the small opportunities because they don't seem like opportunities at all. But the reality is this, it's not about opportunity, lack thereof, big ones or small. It's a simple fact of this simple thing. Who are you? Who are you? Because who you are is irrespective of where you are. Who you are is irrespective of what you have. What you do, if you do it for the right reasons, is not done because of certain criteria. It's done because it is who you are. You are being who you be. And when you can be who you be, the reality is this, the small things don't seem small anymore because you would treat the small thing the same way you would treat the big thing. Would you preach to one the same way you'd preach to 10,000? Would you love one the same way that you'd love in front of someone watching you love someone? Would you clean? Would you do? Would you serve? Would you trek to bring a message for one? Would you brave mountains? People that may rob you? personal sacrifice, would you do it if you were bringing it to one? Because if you wouldn't do it and I wouldn't do it if we were bringing it to one, we're not in it for the right reason. And Jake this week, who leads our youth with Lauren, spoke an incredible message at our staff here, which is every Wednesday at 6.30. Anyone that wants to just get leadership perspective and know more about who we are, you can come to that 6.30 here, 6.30 to 7.30. He spoke this simple message about leadership and he said this, leaders, titles follow leaders. Leaders don't follow titles. And if we're gonna be the church that we're called to be, the penny has to drop and the realisation has to come that it's not about me and Audrey and it's not about perfect people and it's not about better looking people and it's not about taller people. It's not about more able people. It's about you and me trying and deciding to be someone that God's called us to be. We've gotta be present. We've got to be here and we've got to be where He's calling us to go. Because when we sleep on the small things, big things go without happening. Have you ever noticed that no miracle? I don't think they anticipated it. Do you ever feel that? No, just me? Really? Thank you. I'll preach to me then. You know what I mean? I, I, I hate when sometimes, some weekends, everyone's so spiritual, they already know what I'm saying. But other weekends, you're all like with me on it. Let's just pretend you're with me on it. You know what I mean? Have you ever noticed? Like, come on, really? Like, do you think that when they grabbed the fish and the, and the bread in the basket, they were like, you know what I mean? Like there was heaps there. Do you think they, I mean, you know, they had a few. They had like four or five. Like I imagine it went a little bit like this. Like he's coming up to a crowd. He's starting to sweat. He's like, I told you, Jesus, feed everyone. How are we going to feed everyone? Feed everyone fish and bars. You're out there. You, just, you send us out there. You're out there back there. You're just back there. No, no, one, you're not going to have to, you know, you don't have to see the angry mob. Angry mobs. Are, look at this guy. This guy, this guy over here. He's going to get angry. He's not happy about it. I don't want, all right, guys. So uh, it, it would seem um, I've only got enough for this last person here and, um, uh, there's, there's just, there's a, there's a little bit more, but then I'm done. There's, what the, what? I wonder if that's a little bit like you and I. We take account for what we think we don't have for the journey we're going to, for the people He's sending us to. But yet, if you keep reaching, He'll keep providing. And maybe the problem is not that you're not ready. Maybe the problem is that you and I aren't willing because I don't think that they went out there going, oh my gosh, don't you love these endless baskets He gives us? Do you know what I mean? Oh, the, I mean, where was this before? I mean, the whole home shopping network started out of that one moment. You know what I mean? Like endless baskets. Like it, it, they didn't anticipate. I don't, think, I don't think Moses thought that the water was gonna go up like that. You know what I mean? He's like, stand in there. I don't have time for this. You know what I mean, look, bam. All right, well, we could do that. We could do that. You know what I mean? So what if the small things you and I have slept on are the big things that God is waiting on? 
What if the small things that you and I have slept on are the big breakthroughs that people in our city are waiting on? Because I know it doesn't seem glamorous and I know it doesn't seem great and I know it's a conflict to our personal schedule and our personal things, but the reality is this, the small things that you could do with your hands become great things when you put them in God's hands and you allow His heart and His uh, plan for our, for our city to unfold. But if that's gonna happen, you and I, we can't sleep on the small things because the small things are actually big things that God's waiting to bless. So maybe you do have enough. If you keep reaching, God will keep providing. We're gonna read about someone in the Bible that if I was like, does anyone have a Bible character you would wanna be? Yeah, sweet, cool. Um, <laughs> me too. Um, but there's like people like, who, who wouldn't wanna be David, you know? Although he, you know, he was like, you know, he didn't get chosen as the first king because he wasn't tall enough and good looking enough. Still, Dave, Davo as I like to call him, Dave, you know, took down a giant, did it with a stone. You know what I mean? He was the man. You know, I'd like to be David, but this next guy, I don't know that I could be. Uh, I've never read his story and been like, ooh. And it's, it's this, don't, don't judge me because the Bible does say you've got to count the cost before you try to build the building. I just know I couldn't do it. John the Baptist. Not feeling it. You know, camel hair. He's wearing camel's hair. He's eating locusts. That just sounds like it gets stuck in your teeth. You know what I mean? Like he's out there. And then on top of that, I would feel a little bit insulted if I was John. I would. Because Jesus, imagine someone comes up to you, hypes you up, like Jesus sends him to the wilderness. So imagine someone hypes you up and someone's like, man, you've got a beautiful voice. The masses need to hear that voice. I mean, I'm telling you, you're going to change the world. So... Come, come, come here, come on, come on. We got this, this soundproof room. Out, out, back there. Wait, wait, come. Right. You, you mean by those dumpsters? Yeah, by those dumpsters, man. By those dumpsters. You go just sit down, you just sit right there and we will not hear a thing, but you praise your heart out. Remember, it's who you be. You'd be a bit insulted. You'd be like, am I that bad that they put me out there? So John the Baptist is told to go preach, but he's preaching where there's no one. I don't know about you, but I think that's a bit of a problem because I'm not the smartest guy in the world and I haven't built a million churches, but I know this, if you're going to preach to someone, there has to be someone. <laughs> Simple deduction. But he sends him where there is no one. He sends him where there are no people. So maybe what we could do, let, let's just read it for a second. And maybe we can find out something about this because I think there's something that we're missing. But I also think it's something that really resonates with most of us because how many times has God sent you somewhere and you've moved to a new city, but yet you don't see the favour in the city that you thought you were gonna see? How often has He placed you in a church, told you that you're called to do something great and yet you're not doing it yet? How often has He asked you to start something, an initiative, a business or whatever it might be, and yet you haven't seen the promises as He has told them? The reality is this, maybe there is something more going on. Maybe we can learn something about Matthew 3, 1 to 6. It says this, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for Him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt, so at least he had an accessory, around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Wait, wait, hold up a second. People went out to him. People went out to him. So he went where there were no people, yet he stayed there. And what does God do? God brings people to Him. So maybe where you're at is not the wrong location. You just need to wait for God to meet you where He's going. Because we often think that it's the big crowd that's needed. But when the Bible speaks in Isaiah of the wilderness, it's not just talking about the barren wilderness. It's talking about the fact that God will put pools in the wilderness speaking this, that God is gonna bring hope where there was no hope. God is gonna speak to the down and out, the person that's not qualified, the person that doesn't seem to have it all together, the up and out, the businessman that seems like everything's good to, and, and everything's going great, yet goes home and everything's falling apart. You know, the person that has mental illness and has been struggling with it, the person with depression, the 
person on more pills than they know how to count, the person that has a past, the person going through their fifth marriage, the person that has gone out and just come out and, and, and ruined everything that they had, lost all their investment, the gambler, the person, this is who he's talking about, that God will go where the message has never been before and He will bring light where there has been no light. I mean, after all, the light shines brightest in the darkness, does it not? So therefore, if the Gospel is good news, who is it good news to? It's good news to somebody who hasn't heard it. It's good news to somebody who needs it. And it's gonna shine brightest where people are darkest, where people are at their worst. So if you and I don't take up the responsibility of understanding that in our lack, God can bring abundance, that we can reach into things that seem empty and provide something that seems significant, we will never move. And John the Baptist went somewhere that made no sense yet when he got there. What did God do? He brought people to Him. And this is what I love about it. When you live the way that this news tells us to live, meaning not judgmental, not pointing the finger, but being a lighthouse of grace and hope, people will make their way to you. You don't need to be somewhere. You don't need to be somewhere where there is a crowd. What you need is a message and a crowd will follow. You don't need a crowd. You need to be someone of substance and they'll be attracted to you. So maybe the place that God wants to send you that makes no logistical sense to you today, maybe it's much like John the Baptist. Made no logistical sense to go to the wilderness, yet the wilderness is where God met him. And when God gives you a message and when God gives you authority, something changes and something takes place. Number one is this, embrace your God-given authority. God-given authority. Have you noticed that when someone has confidence, they just look better? You know what I mean? Like you could wear anything with confidence and people are like, man, I'm not sure if I don't like that or I like that. (laughs) Something about that. The way that that, man, the way they just, you could wear anything because there's something about confidence. But you know, confidence is a decision. It's not, it's not, you're not born with confidence. There are some people that they just, they don't appear to have the rights for more confidence, but they just are. You know what I mean? They're just, they're just super confident. Like, one of my sons was just born with confidence. Just, 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 just walks through a room like he owns it. You know what I mean? He arrives places and he needs to let you know this is, this is now my place. He walks like this. <laughs> Spoke to a kid in school. He walked up to a kid. He goes, hey. And the kid goes, hey. And starts talking to him. He goes, I gotta go. <laughs> but you know what? Confidence, as many things in life, comes from what you focus on. And we can fix our our eyes on all the things that are wrong. We can lend an ear to an enemy that wants to tell you about all the things that are wrong. Or you could fix your eyes on the purpose that God has for us. You could fix your eyes on being more about somebody else's breakthrough than caught up on the lack thereof yours. The reality is you and I could do greater things, but confidence is not given to the beautiful because even the beautiful lack confidence. Confidence is not given to the skillful because even the skillful lack confidence. Confidence is something that you must guard, something you must take and something that you must grab. And confidence is the best word I can give as, an, as, as, a, as a, almost like a, a simile for authority. Authority is the understanding that if Jesus said that He has empowered you to do what He has said you could do, then you need to walk in that. And you can either give up your authority or you could walk in your authority. Authority is not just something that has been given to you. It's something you need to choose to use. Because many things are given to us, but we don't always utilise that which is given. In fact, Luke says this, if you can throw it up, in Luke 14, I believe, is it Luke 14? Or Matthew, no, Luke 16 says this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? We gotta make a decision to be faithful with the small things. And authority is not about people having to recognise who you are and the title you've been given. It's first about you recognising who you are and the title you've been given. See, true authority doesn't have to declare itself. True authority knows what it is and people see it also. If you can't see leadership in you, you'll make people call it out in you. If you can't see God in you, you'll try and be bigger than it and let people know that it's around you. See, when you know it, when you have a revelation of what you are, you see it, you walk to it, other people see it also. So when it comes to 
being all that God called you to be, you've got to understand that your authority is your decision. You've got to grab hold of what God has given you and you've got to walk in it. You've got to choose to speak. I don't always get up here confident. I don't always get up here. And I've got to tell you, sometimes you're awesome to preach to and other times you mean mug me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know if I should take my Apple Watch off and run. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, someone wants to take something. But do I stand there and do I allow you to, di to dictate the level of how I speak? In any, pre in any moment that you preach, there's critics. And it's funny, I don't know what it is and I don't know why, but critics are so loud whilst being so quiet. Do I let the, cri the critic dictate the level of what I'll bring? Because if you're gonna allow people to dictate what you do or do not do, you don't have a handle on why you're there to do it. See, I grab hold of the authority that Christ has given me. And I realise that the authority He has given me is not in my brilliance, it's not in my cleverness, it's not in the wit, it's not in my ability to work things out. The authority He's given me is simply this, I trust that He said He'll catch me, so I'll jump. I trust that He said if I speak, He'll be on it. And I've got to tell you this, there have been moments and messages that I've preached that feel like there is just the worst message ever. And you know what? The reality is it doesn't matter because if God is on it, something trans just, it just transforms. And God does something. And so over the years, what I've learned is I can live at the level of my environment or if I grab my authority, I dictate my environment. And when I know that my authority is to bring the, to set the captives free, to bring the good news to the broken, then the reality is I don't care if there's only one broken person, I'll bring it and I'll bring it with everything I've got because I'm not gonna allow what I have or what I don't have or what someone says. And most of the time, they're not even saying it. You're just perceiving it. Authority is something you've got to hold. Authority is something you've got to walk in. Walk in on Monday like you own your office. Walk into your situation like you are in control of it. And I'm not saying it because this is positive thinking. No, you know why you're in control of it? Because if He is for you, who could be against you? Because if you have faith in Him, He will do all things that you've asked Him for. God is there and all we've got to do is understand that He's got authority and He has given it to us to set the captives free. You've been called to do something great and you will do it irrespective of the things that you are still lacking. Number two is this, position yourself. Positioning yourself is everything. When you can position yourself in the right place, good things happen. When I played soccer, I was a bit lazy. I didn't like running a lot. But I just positioned myself right where I needed to be. Always on the last man, always a little bit just before. So if I got an offside, I wasn't always caught, but I got places because I positioned myself. When I went to soccer tryouts, there's 300, 400 people trying out for this level. I didn't stand out. But I learned after one time of not standing out, that won't happen again. So I, I bought, I don't even like Barcelona, they're the devil, it's Real Madrid. <laughs> but I had a Barcelona bright yellow jersey because it was visible. I yelled like you couldn't believe, like pass me the ball, like lost my voice after every soccer trial. Why? Because if you position yourself, you're more likely to be put places that you never would have been put before. How are you positioning yourself right now? Are you positioned for the breakthrough you're looking for? Have you positioned yourself for healing? Because you've got to make a decision to position yourself for healing. You know how they say time heals all wounds? It's a lie. Makes no sense. Why would we need hospital then? I broke my arm, just gonna wait. Just gonna wait it out. It makes no sense in the physical and it makes no sense in the spiritual and the emotional. The things that have happened, if you don't deal with them, they don't get healed. Those wounds don't heal, they fester. And the things that fester start to change the way you run, the way you see things, the way you do things. We need to position ourselves for healing. You can't just go to church and expect the benefits of being part of the church. You gotta be part of the church for the benefits of being part of the church. You gotta join a small group. You gotta join a grow group. You gotta get around people. But I've got trust issues. Position yourself for a new experience. Because as long as you keep allowing yourself to live to the level of your labels, that's exactly where you'll stay. You know how there's people that often say, I'm the kind of person that, and I'm just kind of, I'm the kind of person that, there's some people where I'm in conversation with and that I'm the kind of person is every second phrase. I'm like, do you just wanna let me know who you are? Is this just, is this a nervous tick? I don't know what's going on here. And sometimes we're really good at embracing who we are. You know why? Because if, if you can put strong boundaries on who you are, you also now have put strong boundaries on who you don't have to try to be. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a person that gets into crowds. So you've just counted yourself out. 
and you've created a safe zone. Uh, I don't know, I'm not really an out, I'm, an, I'm not an outgoing person. I'm not a speaker. Oh, I'm not just really good with, I don't think it's my gift to. Chris Carmona is a very fluid topic. Chris Carmona as an identity is whatever I need to be to get where I need to go. I, if, if you love surfing and I wanna bring you to church, I now surf. If you love playing football, I now play football. If you love like CrossFit, I hate you for loving it, but now I love it and we gotta do it together. But for real, because Paul says, be all things, meaning have a little bit of relatability to every single person, be in their shoes, know a little bit about them. Don't get so caught up in who you are that you get restricted with who you are. You're called to be bigger than your previous experiences. Don't limit yourself by your natural personality traits. Passion knows no bounds. I never thought I'd do this. I didn't have the confidence to speak in a circle of four people. Now I'll speak in thousands. You know why? Because if you get, if you get consumed with purpose, it gets bigger than problems. And I'm not, when I get up here or when I preach anywhere, you know, the number one recipe for me to not be, to, to not like bomb and, and do terrible is just get consumed with purpose for the situation. Know that there are people that need you. It's not about you. You don't need to get up there, wonder what you look like. So when you roll up to work tomorrow, strut with a little bit of confidence because you have arrived and you are needed there and God has placed you there and there is something for you to bring. And this is the essence of the Gospel. It's a great commission that Jesus did not just die and say, peace, meet you in heaven, hold the fort. You know how Christians have that hold the fort mentality? Just holding the fort. Don't wanna mess with the, with the world. Might get contaminated. Might lose my salvation. Did you ever really have it if that's the way you're living with it? because Jesus gave you something, a gift that you might give it to others. Meaning this, that when you embrace the purpose of the Gospel and the Great Commission, your insecurity starts to fall on the wayside. Maybe John the Baptist wasn't the most comfortable with what he was doing, but I guarantee you this, from birth he knew why he was there and it put him in a place that made no sense and he made an impact that we've never seen before. In fact, the Bible says that there, are, there will be no greater than him. There's something to be learned about positioning yourself for healing. Position yourself for influence. You know the simple recipe for influence? You gotta trust that God's got it on your life. Secondly, get around people. You can't be an influencer unless you're around people. Who do you hang with? And secondly, do they influence you or do you influence them? You need to hang with more people. If Jesus has something on your life, you've got to get around the people in your workplace, the people in your university, the people in your family, the people in your neighbourhood. Don't be that neighbour that just, you, you know, when you look at the neighbour that you don't talk to, but you kind of want to talk to, and you both do that look and you, you keep looking and then he looks and then he looks away and then you're like, oh wait, I'll look and say, and then he looks away and you're like, and you just, oh, I've got to go. Don't be that person. Be someone bigger than that. You've got to be crazy like the, the dude on, on River Monsters. He's nuts. You seen him? You seen river monsters? Can I just say, before, I grew up in Australia with a lot of sharks, so I was always afraid of the ocean. Now I'm just afraid of water. Like he's ruined everything. Can't even swim in a pool anymore. So he goes to India once and he's like fishing for this thing and he's like, it's a man eater. And he's getting pumped. He's like, it's a man eater. I'm like, that's a good reason to just, just go. Just go. He takes his shoes off, gets knee deep. There are reports here of it swallowing men whole. If that's me, I'm out. <laughs> Peace. But he it gets crazier. On this particular one, he get it gets like, zzz, and he's like, "Ooh, this is a big one." I'm like, "Yeah, cut, just cut it, <laughs> cut it, man, cut it." So he's, he's trying, struggling for hours, veins are popping, poor guy almost gave himself an aneurysm, he's full on going hard. Next thing he goes this, looks like I'm gonna have to take a swim with this one. I'm sitting there, I'm having conversations with this guy, you don't have to, you don't have to, don't do it. It's already taken one life, don't let it take another. And next thing you know, he's floating down river. I'm like, bro, you're not fishing anymore. You are being fished. The fish is like, check this guy out, what a loser. The moral of the story is this. You need to know when you're the one fishing and you're the one being fished. Not all fish are meant to be caught by you. 
not all people are gonna be influenced by you. And if you find yourself having to go in the river, if you find yourself having to go for a swim, leaving what you believe in, leaving the best version of yourself, that's not the place that you need to be. There are plenty other places that you can catch. There are plenty other places that you can influence. Position yourself in those places. Know yourself well enough when you are being influenced and when you are influencing. Third thing is this, know what to share. Uh, This is a big issue in my home at the moment because with four children, they don't know. There's things they share they shouldn't share and then there's things they don't share that they should share, right? So there's like toys and I'm like, share the toys. But then like they'll be drinking milk. I don't think milk should be shared. Do you know what I mean? Like if milk is in a cup, you don't share that. You know what I mean? Or they'll share like, they'll share like a lollipop. Like Kingston will be lollipop and then Madden will be like, can I have something? He's like, bam, boom, done. No problem. They'll share everything like that. They'll share things. I'm like, share. have you ever been in the room with someone that's an oversharer? I remember I was like, working out a wormhole and I'm sitting there and this woman and this guy are on their first date because I was overhearing. It was a busy day at work. And uh, she was saying things that I'm like, you don't, you don't. I wanted to just be behind her going. I know you're nervous, but breathe. Just breathe. She's saying things that are so personal. And I was like, oh, wow. Women are far more oversharers than men. Like, you know what I mean? Like when us guys get together, how you going? Good. How's everything? Great. Good. Women, so let me just tell you. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I get nervous when Audrey goes out places. I'm like, babe, there are rules that these are the things that are in our house. You You just don't share about, okay? No one needs to know this stuff. I know that women are very open and friendly, but just shh. You gotta know what to share. And as someone that's gonna try to reach someone, you gotta know what to share. You gotta know what to share. Do you know your story? And do you have a down pat? Do you have it in like 30 seconds? Why? Because if you do, it means you're prepped to do something with it. Know what God did for you. Do you know? Because we have a saying in People Church, what you don't celebrate, you can't replicate. So many organisations lose who they were because they didn't realise what it was that got them to that point. They didn't realise the good things and how good they were that got them there. Have you maybe lost sight of who God is in your life? Was He once good and now you look at Him negative? Was He once Saviour and now you see Him as restrictor? Was He once the one that brought hope and now you wonder if He'll ever do it because He hasn't jumped on board with your requests? Maybe what He hasn't given you is more of a blessing than it would be to receive it. You need to know what to share. If you need to know what to share, you need to grab a hold of who Jesus is. Know what He actually gave you. What has God done for you? Do you realise that you are here not as a product of what God, of what you have done for God, but what God has done for you? I like to say it this way. You ever been to, the, you ever been to a Bulls game? You go to a Bulls game and it's inevitable if you're like me and it's not super packed. Well, maybe, oh man, I'm really throwing myself. I just started the story realising there's a lot of room for judgment now. So let, it, let, let us tell it in third person. Have you ever been to the Bulls game and there's that guy sitting next to you and there's free seats all down the front and he gets up, the audacity, climbs out of his seat and sits in the free seats. And then someone else comes that actually sits in those seats at the fourth quarter, which I'm like, why are you even coming? But anyway, comes in and they have the awkward interaction and the person that's in the seats for free is like, oh, you know, just, <laughs> and just walks and just goes. They don't even come back up, they just go. I think that is the greatest picture of understanding what God did for us and grace. Grace is like sitting in the seats that you didn't pay for. Grace is not like the seats you paid for. You know, when you got seats, you feel there's a right. You know what I mean? You get a bit demanding. I'm at, I'm at D14. Okay, this is D14, I play for D14, D15. But when you didn't pay for the seat, you're a little bit like, oh, sorry. Someone even looks at you like, they're yours. Dude looks back at you, I'm just selling popcorn, man. Just selling popcorn. Understanding what Jesus did for us is understanding that you and I, we didn't pay for the seats. 
You and I didn't pay for what, and that is the greatest thing that we can give. Know what to share. Share stories of how God has impacted your life, how God has brought grace. Share stories, not from a place of perfection, but from a place of imperfection, because God and people, people, sorry, take great heart out of the fact that you are where you are and you're still going through what you're going through. And the last thing is this. The last thing is this. Know how to bring people to the table. There's something about sitting at a table with people that is very leveling. You know what I mean? Something about a round table that is even more leveling. The fact that everybody's at the same place, bringing people, breaking bread. I mean, the most dignified person can become the most normal person the minute that soup just ends up down there. You know what I mean? Like the minute that everything just comes together. I want, I want to read to you a parable where Jesus is kind of speaking about the power of this. He's speaking about the Jewish people that he had, they had a relationship with God and then talking about how Jesus is coming for the rest, for everybody else that didn't have a seat at the table. I think it's such a beautiful story because it really is indicative of what you and I have been in, encompassed in and what we now have an opportunity to do. It says this, the servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and countries and lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. You gotta understand that there is something on offer that is tangible. And we often look at this, you know, as a Christian, what am I gonna give someone? It's not tangible. What, what, can, I, what can I bring? Well, you gotta understand, there is a lot of tangible things that, are not in, that, that seem intangible. It is intangible to put your finger on the insecurity. It is intangible for you to grab hold of depression. It is intangible for you to have a, paint a picture of sadness. It's, it's intangible for those things, but they are tangibly with people. Hopelessness seems intangible, but it's tangibly present in our community, on the South and the West side, a, a lack of unity, in our, in our city and our nation is hard to put a finger on, but it's there, it's tangible. And the, the thing is this, by ignoring them doesn't mean they're gonna change. And you and I have to realise that God has given us a meal, a banquet, a tangible thing to bring to the table of people that are starving for it. We often say this at People Church, if you are hungry, any message is a good message. Like if I'm really hungry, Audrey can serve like saltine crackers with butter and I'm like, babe, you have outdone yourself. You know what I mean? Because you're hungry, you get about it. And I wonder how many people are at our table. Have you even got a dinner list of people that need to get to you, people that need to eat these great things that are there on offer? There is grace on offer, there is dignity. And dignity can be as simple as looking another human in the eye and actually speaking life into them. You might not have to have much, but what you do have with the weight of God behind it is a lot. In fact, that moment, where I believe it was Peter and John at the gate called Beautiful. He says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the Name of Jesus, get up and walk. Not, not everybody is actually crippled, but many people are crippled. Not everybody's actually blind, but many people live blind. You and I see, and we need to choose to see the opportunity to help people, the small things, rather than see the reasons why we shouldn't. People Church, the heartbeat of our Sunday, is nothing more than empowering the extremities of our church, the arms, the hands, the feet, the you and me to do something on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I pray that this message will do something inside of you to embrace the things that you haven't changed and do what God has called you to do. Sign up to a small group, be part of a grow group. Why? Because you can't change without other people in your world. Get a part of this, join a serve team. Make a commitment that if you come two Sundays a month, step up your game and come three Sundays a month. If you, whatever it might be, just get that next step. Keep stepping, the small things, small things. The momentum in your life will be the collection of small things done over and over and over and well. Keep moving, keep stepping. If you, maybe you've been around and you've been a Christian for years, why don't you ask how you could lead a grow group? Why don't you ask how you could influence others? It's on our life, there are things to do. When you walk through the office, when you go, out this week, buy a few more coffees for the people behind you. It seems small, but I don't think that feeding people out of a basket 
was ever intended in their eyes to be the way it went out. But when Jesus is behind the insignificant, small daily tasks, don't you love that about Jesus? Just feeding people became a miracle. Just an everyday task became something great. Maybe there's a whole bunch of mundane things that God is waiting to move on in you and I's life. And we've just got to step to the plate. If this speaks to you, which I hope it does, if this speaks to you out of just faith and a declaration that we're gonna move, why don't we give God a shout of praise in this place?